that you're here with. So what I've read is that there's there's 20 young people like yourself and you've been sponsored or you've you won a competition to get here. Tell us a bit about that, Olivia. Yes, so there's 20 of us and we're representing all different parts of the UK. Um, we've all got our own little networks in our regions where we meet normally weekly or something and we have we talk about how we can help in our area. And we've all met here today to, we met here over this week to try and get our input to the people around here and also get some ideas from other people at COP26. Okay, well, we're going to come back to you in a minute, um, Olivia and um, Costa. We're going to come back to you in a minute and ask you about um, uh, what sort of difference your youth group's going to be able to make. But let's go back over to Valerie, um, because Valerie, you're in the blue zone um, on the nuclear stand. So tell us a bit about what's happening on the on the nuclear stand here. So, so here uh, we have the, on the nuclear stand, what we do is that we just welcome people that are walking around. And uh, if you have questions about nuclear, we answer the questions. Um, but in addition, there has been lots of different events much more many events compared with over years that's a very big difference that i see this year versus other years um and there's been lots of uh, events about nuclear for instance yesterday um the french government has hosted um an, an event on nuclear innovation and what are the synergies that we can have thanks to nuclear innovation between nuclear and renewables to meet our climate goals and we had we're very happy because it was a very um, a VIP event with lots of uh, VIPs, like a Minister of Finance. We had Suchi Biro, we'll see a uh, Director General for the um, uh, uh, Energy, International Energy Agency. Oh, wow. Had, so you had, uh, Rafa, you had him on Rafa, the... You had yeah. him on your stand, yeah? Yeah, and we have Rafael Grossi with uh, Director General for the IAEA. And wow. so we had a very interesting conversation uh, on these innovations that we're going to have uh, such as, for instance, on flexibility of nuclear, so we can do some load follow uh, on variable renewables. Uh, we also have new uh, reactor designs, and we also, and that's something people don't know, is that with nuclear, you can do electricity, and we will need a lot of electricity, for sure, uh, to meet our climate goals, but you can also, do, also can do some heat. So you can do heat for um, housing, you can do heat for industry at very high temperature. You're going to do a lot of hydrogen, you can produce a massive amount of hydrogen and we will need hydrogen, we'll need synthetic fuel. So um, I was really excited because usually, because some people are against nuclear, um, we, were, we cannot really present the solution and answer the questions. And this year we had plenty of opportunities more than other years to present nuclear and have discussions and dialogues about nuclear. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me just ask the question. I think um, people are aware of um, you know, low carbon energy. They're aware of solar, wind and nuclear in this area. In the UK, we get a lot of discussion here about wind energy because that's uh, popular here. But tell us a bit about what sort of reception you're getting to nuclear. I mean, what are people, uh, what are people saying? Are people willing to people willing to talk about nuclear and consider nuclear as a, an option on a world basis do you think valerie yeah. i would say that um people here are curious about nuclear so they really um they're asking questions and they want to engage with us because it's very rare that you know we can talk about nuclear um usually the discussion about nuclear is shut down by anti-nuclear groups and here, and, this, and people are curious because they don't know about it. They heard stuff. And, and so they're open to discussion, right? Mm -hmm. So that we've seen heat on the booths um, in, in the corridors of, of the blue zone. Um, but I think we're seeing more and more interest in uh, nuclear because people understand that uh, it's going to be very difficult to reach our climate goals if we don't use all the technologies that are available. And nuclear is available plus it's dispatchable. So it's very complementary to renewables because even if you have lots of renewables at some point in time, you need some dispatchable energies. And nuclear is a very competitive energy versus a storage technology. And it's available because some of the uh, future storage technologies don't exist yet. Um, okay. So people understand more and more uh, the value of nuclear. Yeah. 
So I'm going to come back to the young people in a minute, but just before I do that, um, what's your take, Valerie, on the sort of balance between the um, con more conventional nuclear, like we're getting in the UK at Hinkley Point, um, and the um, this the small modular reactors that there's been a lot of talk about, which um, there's yeah. been news in the press about Rolls-Royce building. So how do you see the balance between these two technologies? Well, it depends on what your needs are. I think the UK and France, we have the very strong grids. <laughs> we have uh, big countries with uh, a lot of industries. So at that point, um, both in the UK and in France, we need to renew our existing fleets it's urgent and we need a big unit to make sure that to ensure security of supply, right? And we also, I think for the UK, there's also uh, the reliance on gas, which is something that you want to get rid of, especially now that we have experiencing this crisis on energy markets, right? So I think both countries, we are in, emer we are in emergency mode. We have to renew our fleet and we have to refuel our fleet on a limited number of sites so we actually need to have the units, which you call conventional, but technically it's the latest generation reactors. I think in the 30s, we will need more different types of reactors in addition to the big reactors uh, so that we can provide, um, we can do heat, we can do, uh, we can do hydrogen in a more flexible way, probably with the smaller units. And uh, so I think we will have both in our countries, uh, probably big units for electricity, smaller units for um, you know, territorial energy systems. And but I think other countries, they will probably will not go through big units because they don't have a grid yet. And they will start with smaller units. Uh, when you look at the north of Canada or the north of Russia, the isolated sites, well, small units are perfect for that because they can do heat, they can do electricity. And in a very competitive way versus, you know, right now these guys are using fuel or coal, right? So um, so I think they will be really, um, Compared with what you've experienced in the 70s and 80s, there will be a diverse market with different needs and different uh, value propositions, yes. Okay. That's a really, really helpful explanation, Valerie, of the difference between the two. But I'll come back to you in a minute, and we're going to talk about China. But um, for now, let's back over to uh, um, Olivia and to Costa. So, uh, Olivia and Costa, would one of you like to have a go, first of all, at this question about what sort of difference the 20 of um, you young people are, you think are going to be able to make here over this um, weekend? So, um, I think that we've really been sent um, up to COP um, in order to represent a youth voice. Um, so, we've been talking to people in our communities locally um, so sorry for me and, and Somerset um, and uh, we're kind of as we're talking to people and making uh, connections with others here um, we're representing the voice of what um, our friends and family and people in our communities have told us um, and we're going to be taking back what we've learned from our experience here um, and sharing that back with our community so um, in a way we're acting as representatives um, for people in our community um, uh, closer to home, um, I think that this experience is uh, really going to shape a lot of us um, and is going to be a great uh, personal development opportunity um, and uh, can really use that to make an impact um, in people that I meet in the future um, and help engage people with the climate crisis in general. Amazing. So in terms of what you've learned here, let's ask Olivia that question. Um, Costa, you were talking about what you've learned while you're here. So Olivia, from what you've seen so far, what what's, um, what you, have you found that's been most exciting at COP26 that's really fired you up about something? I think I met, we went to one stand and they were giving out all these free seeds and it's, it's a thing where you make a promise to the planet um, about one thing that you were going to keep and you were going to make sure throughout your entire life that you do. So we've all been given these seeds to plant when we get home and to, you know, look after those seeds as if they were like the entire planet and treat them how we want the whole planet to be treated. And I think there's quite a few nice teaching ways that things like that, that you can bring back home and kind of encourage younger kids and other other people to try and take that message on board. Amazing. Amazing. So, um, Costa, what about yourself? Um, so I've been interested uh, for a long time uh, in uh, preservation of uh, land for indigenous peoples um, 
and kind of preserving indigenous knowledge. And there's a really interesting um, organization that I met today called the Global Alliance of Territorial Communities. Um, and they've been doing a lot of work uh, with land rights and protecting um, land for um, indigenous communities who safeguard the majority of the world's biodiversity. So it's really key um, with a lot of these environmental issues because uh, in a way these are the people who have been uh, safeguarding the earth you know, for hundreds of years and um, they have the knowledge to continue doing so. That's, a, that's great, um, Costa. There's a statistic that I've heard, which is that the indigenous people are something like 5% of the world's population, and they protect something like, um, what was the number? They protect a huge proportion of the I, world. I think it was 8, 8%, I think they said. 5% uh, 5% of the world's uh, people, indigenous people, protect 80% uh, of the world's biodiversity or something along those lines. Magic. I've, forgot, I've forgotten the number, Costa, so, so thank you for helping me with that. Um, so that's really amazing. So uh, I don't know, Valerie, whether, you're, whether you found out anything from Brazil. But let me, oh, let me just ask you, Costa, any particular country that you're focusing on in terms of indigenous people, any, any country that you know more about? Of indigenous people called the Hadzabe, um, that live in Tanzania, which I've been uh, researching and doing uh, quite a few art projects on at school. Um, and it's uh, they're a group of people that uh, I personally reconnect with because they're one of the last hunter-gatherer communities on the planet. Um, and they uh, have a lot of uh, kind of indigenous knowledge with their interaction with animals and meat. Um, and I think that we need a, re a really big societal change um, in order to kind of... Uh, kind of strike balance with the earth again um, and these are people that still have that balance and they're under threat from kind of uh, agri different agricultural practices that are spreading um, in their areas and I think that um, kind of preventing that is really key to our adaptation. That's amazing. Um, okay, so I've never heard of that indigenous group before. So thank you, um, Costa, for sharing that. That's absolutely amazing. Um, and and by the way, do put any links in the chat if you'd like to. But let's come back over to, to Valerie. So Valerie, there's been a, a, an amazing announcement this morning about China. Would you like to tell us about it? Oh, so you mean the announcement about the, the uh, 200 gigawatts that they're going to build? That's what sure. you're talking about. Tell us yeah. about it. It's really amazing because um, we see that China is really engaged into uh, getting out of coal. And I think that's something I really liked about this COP, actually, <laughs> is that we have announcements that are not, that are really concrete. We had these announcements about um, cutting methane leaks, right? We have this announcement about reforestation. And we have this announcement about, um, about shutting down coal. And nuclear is actually very effective to shut down coal because it's, uh, it's, it produces massive amount of electricity on very little land. So you can actually install um, a nuclear plant, like a small modular reactor, on a coal site and, and actually use the um, existing transmission, you know, more of the skills from the workers and are actually the same skills because it's just a steam machine in the end. <laughs> So uh, it's very good to go from coal to nuclear. It's quite easy, I would say. And you can see that China is engaged in getting out of coal or reducing their amount of coal. And they invest massively in renewables, but they also invest massively in nuclear. Because even in, um, in systems, in electric systems, with uh, a lot of new renewable energies, you still need some dispatchable source that's going to provide base load and that's going to ensure security of supply and the stability of the electricity network. You know, electricity cannot be stored in a massive way. So at any point in time, you have to adapt production and demand. And nuclear is very flexible. It produces on demand 24 seven. And so you can see that China understands that and their strategy includes renewable and nuclear and probably they will include TCS, you know, and, and all those technologies. Uh, and I think the TV role, I think is when he talks about it, he said, we will need all solutions and actually, and we don't have the choice of using this technology or this one, we need all of them. It's not like, I, I like this one and this one I don't like. I, I just need everything. And and um, and I think it's very important in political negotiations because we've seen in Europe, some countries want to use nuclear 
<laughs> some countries don't like nuclear, but they want to prevent others from using nuclear. So um, I think we we have to acknowledge that we will need to share a significant amount of nuclear to reach you know our goals. And Fatih Bureau said yesterday we need to double the uh, production of nuclear by 2050. That's the challenge for the industry. So what's great about China is that they have proven because they had a continued industrial program on nuclear that able to build a um, massive amount of nuclear. They can build fast, right? Which is something um, we have we we have to come back to it in Western Europe because we've lost the experience, and we need to build back to learn how to build back fast, right? And I know in the UK, we're waiting for decisions as well. And first in France, we're waiting a decision on uh, 60, 60 pair units uh, coming soon, we hope. <laughs> um, and and that, I think the challenge for us uh, will be really to learn again and uh, develop our skills, our project management skills to be able to build the units really fast. And I think, so there's this question about, I like EPR, I like AP1000, I like this type of reactors. I don't think it's the key because I think the key is really ability to run projects effectively, right? And all the designs are good. I think what we're missing today and that we have to rebuild is our ability to manage these projects okay. in a very effective manner. Okay, so Gary, do you want to bring Stefan, Stefan Sabarezi onto the, the screen? Stefan, and let are me you just, ready? Before, before you do that, let me just um, clarify the announcement that we're talking about. So the announcement we've just spoken about is um, it was on Bloomberg this morning and Bloomberg announced that China is going to spend 440 billion US dollars on a massive nuclear build out. And so that involves building at least 150 new reactors in the last in the next 15 years. OK, and that is more than the rest of the world has built in the past 35. So, um, Stefan, we're going to come to you in a minute, but let's go back to the uh, the young people next. And um, so, um, Olivia, a bit special here because um, you you actually live just a short drive from the amazing um, Hinkley Point nuclear power station, which is famed for uh, what is it 91 power 50 per per gigawatt hour so um we've been talking about more nuclear nuclear for china etc cetera, etc cetera. um as someone who who lives near hinkley point um what's your um do you do you have a comment on what's happening there Gemma? Uh, oh, sorry Gemma. <laughs> olivia um i wouldn't say i have a comment on it as such but there is, is there's a lot going on around there when whenever you drive i've had a tour around there there's always always busy there's always so much going on um i did a i did a work experience thing there about a year ago um and yeah it, it was it's a very interesting place so tell us a little about uh, we're all we're all massively excited now what does it mean what do you actually do when you do work experience on a nuclear power station building site tell us tell us more um, so I was I was doing it with a college and we went there for a tour and we were going round. Um, because I was only 13, 14 when we went round, we weren't actually allowed completely off the coach, but we would drive round, we would stop at different places and we, had, we would have workers talking to us about what they were doing, um, like the different the different things that was going on. Um, things like that. I just remember there being lots of massive tubes everywhere. Um, there was lo lots of things sticking out the walls and out the ground. Okay, well, I'm really pleased that um, Hinkley Point security felt that a busload of 13 year olds uh, was a massive security risk. But anyway, let's let's move on. Um, so, Costa, do you want to tell? Uh, move on to Costa. Do you want to tell us a bit about for the rest of your time at um, uh, here at COP? What are you What are you going to be particularly looking at? Um, well, I've uh, had an interesting look around, and there's uh, one thing that I found very interesting. Um, organized by the WWF. Um, they were talking about seagrass um, and okay. seagrass regeneration projects which uh, in, within the UK, which I think is a uh, really interesting and often overlooked um, subject. Um, seagrass and uh, the ocean absorbs 70% uh, of our CO2 emissions, I think yep. it is. Um, yeah. So it's really vital in the fight against climate change. And it's often overlooked when we talk about tree planting um, and stopping deforestation. Um, and one of the key things um, that has been destroying our marine um, ecosystems has been overfishing and that's been uh, ripping out a lot of seagrass beds in the UK. Um, so 
uh, that's something that I'll be definitely looking out for, um, looking definitely at the marine aspect um, and how that links into my interests. So, yeah. Okay. I mean, with the new technology coming along with fishing, I mean, you know, fishing's just such a big thing with these uh, with these ships and industrial equipment and these sorts of things doing all the fishing. I mean, is it not possible, do you think, um, Costa, at this time to, to use technology solutions to know where fishing boats are, to know when they're fishing, when they're not fishing? I mean, I was horrified to see that fleets of fleets of fishing boats are now sort of heading towards the Galapagos. And, um, you know, we had um, we had Alistair talking on the webinar on Wednesday about the fishing situation with um, with the world's tuna in Papua New Guinea. I mean, is it is it going to be possible, do you think, to 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 really try and get this much, much, much more under control than has been done to date, Costa? Well, I think that there's two main issues. The first is um, the rise of illegal, unregulated fishing, um, especially in parts of the world which are uh, much um, more undeveloped. So parts of Africa, um, South America um, are really struggling with this, especially because of foreign uh, European and Chinese mainly um, fishing vessels. Um, in, for, any, for example, in Ethiopia, um, the Ethiopians are only able to get something like 25% of the overall catch. The rest of it is European and Chinese fishing vessels, which are essentially kind of uh, legally, but uh, often unregulated uh, kind of destruction of the ecosystem there, just taking loads of fish out. And um, so the illegal unregulated fishing is a huge problem. And uh, there are a couple of organizations such as Sea, Se sea Shepherd, um, which are really uh, fighting against that and reducing that. And the other issue is that um, governments over the world uh, paying huge subsidies to uh, huge industrial fishing vessels, which is really a big problem. Um, if fishing was uh, done in a more sustainable, localized way with small boats, first of all, it would benefit uh, small communities, coastal communities, much more. Um, and it would, be, um, it would be much harder to overfish. Uh, what we see with these industrial vessels is um, through kind of developments in technology um, is less people are needed, more fish can be taken, um, and, it's, and it can be done in a way where there's a lot more bycatch and uh, there's a huge disconnect with um, what people are actually catching. Um, you know, huge amounts of bycatch are caused um, and there's much less care for the environment because um, they can you know, travel much further out. So what we need is um, this huge industrial fishing, which is just benefiting uh, large corporations to end um, and for there to be a revival of um, kind of artisanal, uh, small scale uh, fishing. Mm. Costa, you are so on top of this issue. I'm just blown away. So for me, there's a couple of things here. One is that um, subsidies, you know, we know about the huge subsidies that are going on. Uh, we know about subsidies for fossil fuels. But wow, this is the first time I've heard about fossil subsidies for fishing ships fishing yeah. vessels so look um while you're here just do everything you can to support stopping this because this is utter nonsense and the second thing is what you've talked about is that the fishing the illegal fishing is being done not by the smaller countries it's being done by the european and chinese they're big countries so surely the countries to my mind these countries should be using technology they should be um, having sensors as to where the ships are and they should, by law, have to have sensors as to whether they're fishing or whether they're just, you know, driving about. So whatever you can do um, over this next few days to, to move that forward, I think be a massive impact on the world. So thank you, Costa. And um, just over to Olivia now, same, same question for you, Olivia. Um, what are you going to be watching out for in the next couple of days? Um, I think the things that I want to look at is much of the smaller projects, the things that it's easier to bring back home and help to implement in our schools and in our communities. Okay. Anything in particular there, Olivia? Um, well, at our secondary school, when I used to be there in year 11, we um, focused a lot on the energy that we were using. Um, so we've implemented solar panels and we've had um, electric car stations that we put in. And we've also tried to make our secondary, our 
sixth form now, um, zero plastic, zero waste is what we're trying to focus on. So if I can get any ideas from here that can help us to fulfill that at our sixth form, then wow. that's great. So, so do, you, do you know, um, Olivia, do you know any of the numbers of how much CO2 your, your school has saved or is that something you're going to be finding um, out over the next couple of days? Um, well, that, the energy side of it is all at my secondary school. Now at my sixth form, it's a little bit different. But there's one idea that we, so what we're doing now, we've got different bags of crisp packets. So we put all of our crisp packets in a bag and then we take them to a charity that iron them and make them into blankets for homeless people. It's 150 crisp packets makes one blanket. So instead of putting them in the bin, we are taking them to a charity. Well, um, we're learning something else every day. So thank you so much for that. So let's come over to Stefan. So Stefan, you're sitting in the middle of a forest in in Corsica, yeah? Um, uh, yes, yes. We are. Well, we, you know, we are blessed with uh, sun and rain, so it's uh, very good. <laughs> Hello, Valerie. Uh, uh, some people are asking, how can we find the nuclear for climate booth in the green zone? In the green zone? Oh, so it's. Um uh in the uh, fa uh so we're in the blue zone that's why people don't find it oh you're in the blue zone. zone sorry okay we're in the blue zone yeah no, that's the easy answer and with a whole five at the end of whole five be behind the brazilian beyonds i show you okay brazilian a very beautiful brazilian group here okay so, so we're in the blue the answer is we're in the blue zone so i i will let them know right away because i i told them i told them i think it's in, it's in the green though green zone but no, we're in the blue zone <laughs> okay thanks okay so, <laughs> so everybody stefan seferesi is the president of saving our planet and um stefan you've been uh, uh, an amazing climate expert for so many years now um, we've got a question come up in the chat from Hugh Rose. We're going to come on to that in a minute. But for, Stefan, first of all, would you like to ask a question of Valerie? Um, yes. So uh, wh what do you expect from uh, COM26 in terms of outcome for uh, support of uh, nuclear power? Uh, so um, what we, we want to, what we expect from the from the event, right, um, is the, first the recognition of our role as a climate solution, uh, because uh, we are a major climate solution because we are available now, and we've proven that we can decarbonize quite fast. And uh, often we never talk about nuclear, so we want to be recognized. <laughs> it's really an issue of recognition, so that the dialogue starts about nuclear. Um, and I think this year, that's what I was saying, I think we're, we're, we're very happy uh, about the way things are uh, because uh, we have been able to really engage and talk to people uh, much more than uh, previous years. So um, it, it, it's really great. And otherwise, what I expect is success for COP26. I expect this as a citizen. Uh, and I think uh, even if people have been criticizing the COP process, I think this year we have major breakthroughs that are very concrete because you know people were saying you know cutting catching methane emission is one of the fastest way we can reduce our emission today and uh, and we have an agreement and yesterday Fatiburo said that actually when you do, we compute all the NDCs I mean the ambitions from the countries that have been provided uh, he, he, he still computed 1.7 degrees so it's good you know it's better than ever so um, so that makes us more hopeful, provided, of course, countries execute on their commitment. And we know that countries have been very hopeful, very ambitious. And now we need to see the results. Uh, I know in France, one thing we're expecting is a decision on the renewal of the nuclear fleet. And if we don't have this renewal, we, we are at risk of not having enough electricity to decarbonize the rest of the economy. Our electricity is already decarbonized, but we need to renew our fleet to make sure we can decarbonize in the long term and especially electrify transportation, which is a place where we spend, we currently use our, our um, let's just answer your question. I, I wanted to make a small comment on, uh, on, uh, on, on what you said about the price of pink clay. I think there, there are really two things I'd like to say. Um, the first one is the first of a kind, right? So, for sure, the price is expected in size world should be much lower because uh, already the second unit has been going much faster than the first unit. So 
you can see that the teams are gaining experience, so they go, they expect they'll go even faster as, as well. Second, I think the UK government is coming up with a financing scheme that's much better than the one that was used for Hinkley, which was financed at 10 percent. So that's very high financial cost. And from what I've seen from the UK government, there's going to be this wrap process that's going to cut down of the cost of financing the unit and in the end cutting the cost of electricity. So I think it, it, it's great. And last but not least, I mean, we think 90 pounds is, you know, is expensive. But right now with the gas prices, the US markets in Europe are more around 200 pounds, right? Wow, um, 200 so pounds. Think, yeah, yeah I think, I think the, the point here is not the price of each means of production of electricity. Of course, it's important, but it's not the only factor. What's, what is important is the price of the whole system. Hmm. And when you have variable production, you will need dispatchable production. So now, whether you want it to be nuclear, it's low carbon, it's great. <laughs> or you okay. want to be high gas, it's high carbon and variable cost, right? Or you want to have storage, and then you don't know yet whether the technologies will be available. Okay. So okay, I've got a quick. Really I've yeah, got a question okay. for you on this, Valerie, and then we'll come over to the young people again. But my question is this: I was on a webinar yesterday, so last week um, there was a day when the UK has got twenty-four gigawatts of wind power, and there was a day when the UK produced twelve gigawatts of actual wind power, and the cost per gigawatt, per cost per megawatt, was about sixty pounds. So the next day, instead of 12 gigawatts of wind power, there was one gigawatt of wind power. And the cost of uh, the cost per megawatt went up to 4,000 pounds per megawatt on that day. So the UK is planning 40 gigawatts of wind. So we're going to go from 24 gigawatts of wind. I'm not sure it's another 40 gigawatts of wind or total. But the, the problem is, if there's a day when there's no wind and only 8% of the, that is delivering, then it's just not going to happen. So just tell us a little bit about, Valerie, how you see nuclear can really help solve that problem that the UK has with, with wind and, and energy. Yeah. So um, when you look at, um, in France, um, our government just ordered a major report that took two years to complete and all the players contributed to this report, we produced, we contributed to this report, but also the wind industry, the solar industry, everyone. Um, and they compared, they had six scenarios, three scenarios about nuclear and three scenarios with nuclear. And when you look at the cost of production, it's about the same for all scenarios. But what makes really a difference is that for uh, scenarios without nuclear, you, have, you need a lot of what they call flexibility. It's usually um, storage, or it could be new technologies such as power to gas, to power to gas to power, where you have, for instance, um, uh, gas, new gas plants that use um, hydrogen, clean hydrogen, for instance, right? If okay. these technologies don't exist, then they can be really costly. And the second thing you have, which is also very costly, is a lot of investment in the grid. Um, to, to make sure that you have security of supply and you maintain system balance. So, so but really what nuclear does is that it, it drives down these prices of so the grid, um, cost of storage, the cost of, uh, of all these um, expensive uh, uh, things that we need to, to have to the network to ensure the balance the, uh, of the system when there's no wind. That, that's really uh, what, what okay. will be costly. What will be costly is the uh, backup systems we need when there's no wind. And that's where nuclear plays a big role. Yes. Okay. So thanks for that, Valerie. We're going to come to a question from Stefan in a minute. But um, sorry, uh, Olivia Costa. Um, we're getting towards the end now. So if you'd like, um, Olivia, would you like any final points to make about what, um, what you've seen, what you've learned, what you're going to be doing? Um, no, nothing else really to add on that, but I just want to thank you for having us here. It's been really interesting to listen to everyone. It's been amazing. I've just gone out of focus, so try and sort that. <laughs> okay. So, um, yes. Okay. Well, thank, thank you so much, uh, Olivia. And I really hope that, um, I really hope that when you get back uh, home to the real life, that you'll be able to tell some more people and persuade more people about the experience that you've had here. What about yourself, Costa? 
Um, one thing I wanted to mention was that um, the commercial fishing, fishing subsidies by um, the largest governments in the world make up something like 30 billion, which is what has been estimated uh, is needed to end world hunger. So uh, really, subsidies are very powerful and uh, I think government subsidies should uh, end, especially with things that are harming the environment. So, yeah. Okay, so Custom. Why don't you, um, it'd be amazing if you could write about that and, um, and email me some stuff about that, because this is new to me. I mean, you know, when people talk about subsidies, I, I, we, I think we automatically think of fossil fuel subsidies and whatever. But the subsidies you've talked about to do with fishing, it'd be really, really amazing to hear um, from you about that. But just a final question for the two of you, um, unless Gary's got anything to add. I'd really like to ask about, in your school a sort of straw poll how many people like yourself are really really passionate about doing something about you know stopping global warming and really making the effort to do something like you have and how many what sort of proportion of people are really saying well look you know they they're just not bothered and happy to happy to let things go as they are okay um well we've got a committee in our school um is this society of everyone who wants to be a part of trying to reduce the plastic consumption and help with climate change in our school mm. i would say in our group we have about 20 people and there's 130 people in the entire sixth form however that's just the people that turn up to the group there are a lot of people that also you know have input around the school you know, they're not part of the group. okay so i think people are becoming more aware of it and are actually wanting to make a difference especially well, okay. in my school especially okay so of those 120 people how many people do you think okay you've got a lot of people are active you've got 20 people are active but how many people do you think are really just not bothered not bothered i, I honestly i wouldn't say anyone is not bothered everyone always everyone i've seen always used the recycling bins always used the bins and spins. really uh, yeah i think we at our school we do try to make it quite a big thing we have posts up everywhere we try to enforce it not enforce it but try to make people aware of it a lot so Amazing. i would say there's a single person at my sixth form that doesn't care at all. okay so um costa what about you at your school um so i've been on the uh well, i sort of set up the environmental committee at my school um three years ago um and i'd say since then the engagement has really um gone through the roof um started off uh, with a really small group and it's building and building and building. So I'd say now in my sixth form, we have around 25% of students who are sort of actively engaged. Um, and I think we've been engaging them through the work that we've been doing in school, but also through um, subjects. We've been trying to embed uh, talking about the climate crisis um, and just ecological awareness within geography um, and the sciences, which has really helped a lot. Um, and. Uh, we've been trying really to engage and get students in the junior school um, interested. Um, so we've been pioneering a project uh, where we've been building bird boxes um, and teaching uh, the junior school students how to build bird boxes um, and assembling them and putting it in the woodland at school. Um, and it, it, what it's doing is it's uh, giving them skills, but it's also um, engaging them from a young age um, into environmental issues to, try, to create a long-term engagement um, and kind of try and instill um, a passion in them. And I'm really hopeful that over time, uh, students are going to become um, more and more engaged in a high percentage of them as well. Fantastic. Well, um, Costa, congratulations. You're the man. You've been driving all this action. And uh, Olivia, too. So, look, uh, we're going to let you two of you go now. And we're going to talk a little bit more about... Charles, if I could just say to the two youngest uh, members of the panel, that your legacy is going to live on. Your, your grandkids will say, wow, you were a cop. So uh, I, I think you're superstars, you're rock stars, you're just amazing. And um, I can't wait till we get back to school and everyone's uh, asking you to sign signatures. And, <laughs> and you've got to, we've some, you've, you've just, uh, it's going to be some great video clips from, from the two of you as well, aren't we, Gary? So big, big thank you. Hang on if you want, but um, we're going to carry on a bit of a discussion now about nuclear. If you've got to go, you've got to go. Yeah, we've got to go. Sorry. Huge thank you to yeah, huge thank you to yourself and to to Gemma who's been hosting you. Thank you so so much. And um, really get this, get some, get all this data that you need, you guys, so that you can make an even bigger difference over the next couple of days thank when you. you get back to your school. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank, thank you so thank much. You. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That's been amazing, absolutely amazing. So, Stefan, 
Over to you. A few more questions I'm sure you've got for Valerie. Yes. So, um, yeah, just a note on, on what we said before, which, which is comparing the price of nuclear and other sources of uh, energy uh, should be really done in the context of a power network, power grid where you want to have uh, available uh, power. And just today, um, we, we can see that at COP26, half of the power is coming from wind and the other half is coming from nuclear. Um, and without nuclear, that network would, not, would simply just not work. Uh, if you want to shut off the nuclear power, you'll have to replace it with something like gas or, or oil or coal. And, and that's definitely not the way forward. Um, so I think the, the, the choice is simple. If, if you want to, instead of building size well, if you want to uh, create uh, an available uh, wind field that guarantees three gigawatts of uh, power available all the time, it means about 300 gigawatts of wind power because the the guaranteed uh the guaranteed uh, power output of uh, of an average um, wind turbine park is about one percent so uh, if you wanted to build 300 gigawatts of wind turbines in uh, in the uk um, that that would mean um about uh, 10,000 uh, really big wind turbines. So uh, you see, it's, it's not workable. It's not a workable solution to rely only on wind or uh, on, on um, some kind of power. We, you need a mix of many different solutions uh, that can uh, actually fit the, the, the needs okay. of the power grid. So look, we're coming to the end of the time now. So Valerie, um, any final points from you you'd like to make before we close? No, I think um, I think we have to be trustful, and uh, I know it's a uh, negotiation process. Are can be frustrating because we feel we haven't made progress, but I think we do. And uh, from what I see um, uh, from the discussions that we're having uh, this week at COP, I think uh, we've um, never been so so close. I think we're, we've made a lot of progress uh, towards. I hope. Um, making a difference and we talk, you know, climate goals. Great. That's that's good very good. Thank you, Valerie. <laughs> Gary, any Thank comments you. from you? Um, with every day, I, I feel more optimism. Me Keeping too. Keeping 1.5 yeah. alive is something that we, we the whole reason for this. And uh, like I, we, we are drawing to an end. So I want to thank Charles and Stefan for all their, all their determination and carrying this through. Charles, without you, none of this would be happening. And, and you, I know that you're making such a huge difference. So uh, I, I, on behalf of everyone, we thank you for your energy and what you put into this. Thanks, Gary. Um, this is a sponsored event. Um, so if you'd like to, if you've been listening to this on recording or live and you'd like to contribute, then if, if you're able to um, make a, a donation to us through the website, then we can plant some trees for you. So, so 20 pounds will plant 180 trees. 30 pounds, 270 trees. And if you'd like to plant a thousand or 10,000 trees, then that will make a difference, um, to, huge difference to the planet for everybody. And it's so easy. Piece of it's so easy. So Absolutely. Easy. Um, Valerie, thank you so much for joining us. Have a great, um, have a great rest of the trip here. And uh, same for Stefan. Thank you. thank you. Thank you so much for joining us and your uh, your inspiration and knowledge here. So thank you very, very much. Great to see you. Um, all the very best. Thank you. Right. Oh, wow. Wow, Charles. That was quite something. Do you want me to stop recording? Yep. All right. So this is the end of the recording. The recording next... stopped. So uh, if you're watching live, um, we are next again on saturday we're here again on saturday at 12 o'clock yep so we'll see you um then. so offer to bring people in on the screen if you want You're gary happy with that, yeah? so lisa pauline bob julie